and then I'll just, there we go. Good evening, Hi. friends, on this wonderful Monday um, evening. Um, on uh, the very first Monday, or is it the second Monday of the Women's Month? And allow me to say to all of the women in the world that happy and a blessed Women's Month. And it is my prayer that none of us uh, gets to experience the horrible experiences that most of our sisters and mothers and daughters have experienced. And I pray that during this Women's Month that God can do a new thing in all our lives and in the lives of men. And friends, today we have a topic that I have such great interest in, and I have asked some of the ministers within the Methodist Church of Southern Africa and have received different responses. So today it is my hope that some of my questions and hopefully your questions would be answered by our wonderful and magnificent guest. And before I introduce and welcome the guest this evening, please call everybody so that we can all be a part of this conversation as we learn and hopefully go and teach everybody about vestments and liturgy, you know, and understanding vestments and liturgy in our Christian walk. Friends, let us please close our eyes and pray. Merciful God, you are our Father in heaven. You are our creator parent. And we come before your throne of grace, Lord, thanking you for the gift of life, the blessings of life, the blessings of gifts, and the gift of a calling and callings that you continue to call your people with. Heavenly Father, as we enter into the conversation about understanding vestments and liturgy, we pray, Lord, that you use your son, the one you have chosen, ordained, anointed, and set apart to do your work and serve your people as an ordained minister, not only in the Methodist Church of Africa, of Southern Africa, but in your church universal. Heavenly Father, we pray that you continue to lead this platform as you always have. And Lord, you bless his mouth and you bless his note that he may teach us and Heavenly Father, it is my prayer that after this conversation, we would leave this platform better off and better understanding what our vestments and our liturgy means. Heavenly Father, I pray this, giving you thanks and glory in the mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, now and forevermore. Amen. So, friends, it gives me such great pleasure this evening to welcome the Reverend Don Williams. Uh, Reverend, welcome to the Wesley Guild SA platform. It is such a great pleasure to have you with us tonight. Uh, you are muted. I would need you to unmute your sound. There we go. Right. I must have touched something. <laughs> Greetings to you and everybody who happens to be watching. I'm Don Williams. As you can see, I'm in Nungu. Um, I live down in Nelspruit in the Lowfelt. I'm an ordained minister, and this year it will be 50 years um, that I've been ordained as a minister. Um, I've been retired now for 10 years, and um, so I'm I'm happy to speak to you coming from my perspective and but firstly to say to all ladies to all women we're blessed by you and you are a blessing to all of us thank you and may the lord walk close to you and walk with you and just give you life and joy and 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 and, and meaning into the future um, so bless you ladies uh, go well now um, I've, I've been asked to, to look at this topic, and uh, let me just give you, and I need to say at the start, remember, I'm a white person, I'm a male, I'm a retired minister who was ordained 50 years ago. Um, I've served in many circuits, in many geographic circuits as well. I've been a superintendent many times. Um, I've served as a chaplain in the military forces for 10 years. I've been a supervisor of studies within the Methodist Church. So that's the background that I'm coming with. And what I'm sharing tonight is my experience 
in order that just now we can do questions, which I think would be the more significant um, part. I also need to declare that my passion and gifts center around the pastoral ministry that and you will see this even comes out in what i'm going to present that for me the pastoral getting next to people and doing everything that is going to enable us to minister to people to minister together and to hear the gospel together is what i'm about so anything which is going to help that I'm prepared to go with that because that's my passion is the pastoral side. But after I retired, I landed up doing academics. So um, after I retired, we spent a year touring in a caravan and in chatting to various ministers in churches, I saw how unhappy they were and how Methodist ministers were unhappy in the Methodist church. <laughs> And so I did a master's um, thesis degree on the relationship of Methodist ministers to the Methodist church, because we're actually not employees. And then from that, I went on to do my doctorate, which deals with the decolonization of ordination in the Methodist church, because I've realized that we have not yet and haven't properly become a church of Africa. And you might say, for the white person to, to want to do that, I say, yes, I still believe in our Methodist roots, but we're in Africa, we're not in England, and we need to adapt to that. So it's a tightrope, you know, in, in that. So that's where I come from. And I was approached because I wrote a paper for our doctrine committee of the church on the implications of our theology and dress in the church. And as a result of that, I think that's why I was approached. So um, that's how come I got into it. But remember, I'm coming as a white, male, retired, old man, but with a passion for Africa. And I hope that that, that might be helpful. So that's my background. And uh, so please be gentlemen, uh, gentle with this old man, okay. Now, let me get started. I want to say right at the start, this issue of clerical dress and of dress generally in the church is a minefield. Firstly, for a number of reasons. Firstly, let's remember we're a breakaway as the Methodists from the Anglican denomination, but we retained so many of the influences of the Anglican church including vestments and dress and liturgy. And those are the influences which have remained right from the start. So we need to remember our roots in Anglicanism. But John Wesley was very unhappy with the dress within the Anglican church. And in his sermon, um, uh, we, which, he, uh, which he put out number 97, um, he said, I want you people as Methodists, and he's talking to ministers and laity, to, these are his words, to lay aside all needless ornaments, to avoid needless expense, to be plainness in all around you. And Wesley insisted that his preachers had to be plain, simply dressed, and do away with all the extras which there was within the Anglican Church. So that's our background, which is similar but different. Secondly, in South Africa, we must remember that we are a colonially established church. So when the missionaries came, they brought that influence from England. And one of the first things that they spoke about was to civilize the people. And one of the first things they saw was to civilize was to that they had to dress the way in Western dress and not in African style. So when you look at the photographs, which I did as part of my doctoral studies of the early ministers, you see them very uncomfortable with a collar and tie and a jacket and a suit and all that sort of thing. 
you know, but that's what was expected of them. So we're a colonially established church in Africa, um, and we don't symbolize Africa in our dress. We actually symbolize the, our colonial heritage. So there's another part of our problem. It gets worse. Thirdly, we believe very strongly in the doctrine of the priesthood of all believers. But we set ministers apart and ordain them to word and sacraments or deacons to the word and service. And then we have our organizations. And then we have our evangelists. And then we have the ministry of the laity. But there is strict differentiation between each of them. And everybody has, knows who's the boss, what they can do, how they fit into the system. And so our belief in the doctrine of the priesthood of all believers, whilst we might say that, doesn't come through in our dress and in our vestments and in the way that we treat people. And that's my concern, one of my concerns. And so in my studies, I obviously had to read numerous journals and articles, and I went through di uh, dimensions from the 1970s. What was people's reaction around the issue of dress? And within dimensions, we had black and white ministers, black and white members, people um, writing in and saying, here's a problem. And if I look at journals today from Methodists and non-Methodists, this issue of dress comes through as a power issue, as trying to present an image of power. And this you can see in so many journals of, of European, Black, Indian, uh, within our own country, and extensive journals, um, this issue of power and superiority. So that's from an academic side. Then I want to say we need to take culture into account because there is a difference. You notice that in the photo that you were sent for the WhatsApp group, um, uh, the, your, your group, I purposefully didn't have a, 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 a collar on because I wanted to say this is part of the difference between your largely between your white context and your black context. That in the white context, we tend to dress down, dress less. I don't know, I, um, uh, nail spray is very hot. I don't know when last I ever wore a jacket in the pulpit here in nail spray. Um, let alone a gown, let alone a stole, because I would perspire and be sopping wet at the end. But generally, our, our white cultures dress down. I'm not saying all, generally. But like today, because I'm coming as a minister, I've put a collar on because that's appropriate. And so that's why I've put a collar on. So when it comes to the sacraments, I will always preach in a collar. I'm preaching on Sunday up at Sabi. And I'm going to wear a collar because it's the sacraments. But when I preach there on other times and it's not a sacrament, I might just wear an open neck shirt. And if I wear a suit, they say to me, what's wrong? You know, are you trying to show us something? You know, it's that's the position. Um, there is a difference. And, you know, uh, we're less ceremonial um, and we're uh, less... Uh, uh, but it's also linked to our black context, which is more, uh, which is more circuit based with many churches that the ministers got to go to. Whereas in our white context, largely, we only had one or two or three societies to look after. But it's not like that in the black context. So I'm saying, let's just understand that there is a difference. But I'm just trying to highlight that it can be good and helpful, or it can be not helpful. And I'll come to just now how we need to deal with that. A concern is that for our women, our 
clerical dress is very masculine. Um, and even for our organizations, it looks very masculine. Uh, uh, lovely to see when you go to ordination service and you see the blue and you see the red. Lovely. It, it's stunning. But our women ministers, when I read the letters to Dimension in the past, were saying it's not feminine. And if you look at our codes that are written down, they're not supposed to have frills and uh, colors and that sort of thing. And you ladies need that, you know, and it's part of your expression. So I'm saying the dress regulation is very masculine. Also, it's been adapted by usages. And this is important. The changes that have come haven't been thought through theologically. It's because somebody has liked wearing a, um, a, a robe or has wanted, has liked doing something. Others have liked it and it has been adopted. And so as some ministers today will wear a cassock, when I was ordained in my ordination photograph, we were 36 people, only one person wore a cassock. The rest of us all wear suits. But today, you have to wear a cassock at the ordination service. But that arose through usage at seminary largely, but it's not written down in our church structures. So I'm saying dress in the Methodist church has been ruled by usages, not so much as by theology is the point you know, that, that I'm trying um, to make. And for us as clergy people, the regulations are laid down in your organizations, like in your guild organization, like in the Manana, like in the YNG. It's not in our book of order under the ministry. So that's why we've got all these people wearing these crazy things, because it's not set down and thought through theologically, you know, is, is, is what I'm, I'm saying. And um, we need to remember that um, in, in, from Wesley and Ducom, our theological think tank, that the, the documents that are presented there, like my paper on this, is not the official position of the church, but nowhere is the official position set down. And that's my concern, except in organizations when a minister is a member of the organization. So I'm saying we as a church need to deal with this in our, in our processes. And then lastly, and you might say at last, and I agree, we must remember we're in ecumenical relations with other churches. I have many friends within the Anglican ministry and within the Catholic ministry. And when they look at the Methodist Church Facebook page, they say, Don, what message are your people presenting with their dress code? You've got ministers dressing as if they are cardinals in the Catholic Church. We're in ecumenical congregations with people, and yet we will dress with this elaborate dress and which to them doesn't fit in with those other churches. But we're in ecumenical relations with them. So again, because we haven't thought through these things theologically, we therefore land up with, you know, with our problems that we do. So that's what I want to say about dress. Does that make sense? Just at this stage. I, Absolutely, Rev. Thank you. I it's also very want to comment briefly on liturgy. Can I just make a couple of comments on liturgy and then we can deal with the two together? Okay, yes, you have to with that till earlier. Right, liturgy. Once again, we need to see this is linked to our colonial past because our liturgies, we've taken over the British orders of service. And our communion services, our baptismal services, our covenant service especially, all of those are taken over from the British Methodism. And so we need to see that that's again where our colonial heritage has come in. And so 
in our liturgies, we will use the symbols which you find in your colonial churches. They're not African symbols, which have meaning for African people and for our context. We must also remember that the missionaries were instrumental in recording African languages in South Africa, not only Methodist missionaries, but others. And that's how the African languages were taught, but vice versa in the missionary schools. And remember your mission churches, um, schools was the major education systems in the early years in this country. It was done in English. In the churches, it was the British liturgy. It was the English liturgy that was used. So this is all part of our heritage, which has been, um, be, be, been brought together. The use of creeds um, as a means of education, your missionaries and um, as, as the ministers were going, used the creeds, the siokudumisa, as a means of teaching our people the basics of the faith. And so they were important learning instruments. That's the point. For many people who weren't well educated, the creeds were a means of stabilizing their faith and giving, you know, and, and giving them hope. So that's why I can understand where this issue of liturgy comes into the Methodist system. Um, but again, like the issue of vestments, in our white section, we hardly ever use liturgy other than for the sacraments. But in our black section of the church, virtually everything is liturgy. You will use your book every Sunday, you know, and that is used for the liturgy every Sunday. Whereas in myself, I only use liturgy when it comes to communion and baptism, the sacraments, and special services. So um, again, we need to see that there is a, a, a general difference. Um, as our white section, we tend to dress down. We also be, tend to be less ceremonial. Um, you do have Methodist ministers, a white, who wear cassocks, no doubt about it, but by far the majority, like me, are dressed now just with a shirt, I put a short sleeve jersey on now, um, and you're lucky I've even got a collar on. Now, I don't say that to be ugly. I'm just saying this is, if, if I go to some places wearing a collar, they say, what's wrong? But I went with my superintendent, Reverend Tao, to visit a family once, and he didn't have his collar on. And the people put their finger across his neck to say to him, where's your collar? You know, so I can understand that there is a difference and we need to be careful in how we bring this, you know, bring this all together. So, um, again, it's a it's a minefield and I just hope you haven't got me to walk into the minefield to blow me up. But I've spoken for 20 minutes. Um, I'd rather answer questions. I've, I hope I've set you thinking a bit. I'd rather that we deal, deal with some of the issues. I will listen, you ask, and I'll try and answer. Yeah, perfect. Thank you so much, uh, Reverend, for such a precise but also honest submission regarding both our dress code vestments and also the liturgy. Uh, please allow me to start from the, from the end. Let me start with the questions from where you ended now. In terms of the creed, um, I am so aware, and this is also why Black people services or African services are so much longer than white services. Yeah. Because with white services, the only thing that I think is being used from, from maybe the hymn book or anything, it is just the Lord's Prayer and nothing else. <laughs> Whereas in the African uh, context, we have Sebudumi Satik, which is so long. We have mm -hmm. Ndiya uh, which is the Apostles' Creed. We have uh, Gobani, uh, you know, so we have all of these things yeah. that we go through. And if it's a long service or like a, a, um, the, what do you call it? This service that we have in the beginning of the year, then we have uh, Litani that we do. 
Yeah, the covenant service. Thank you. Then we also do litani there. Then now the service is like four or even five hours longer. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Um, and you are saying that all of these are basically usages. So why are these only applicable to black people and not to white people in the Methodist Church of Southern Africa? Um, I, th I think it's something to do with, 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 with our cultures. I think that's a major issue. You know, as I said to you, uh, I've been with Reverend Tao and with Reverend Van der Lecky, um, and with uh, Sam, um, you know, in, in different contexts, um, where it's expected that their Maruti needs to be dressed in the way that he is. Otherwise, um, they feel he's not, he's not having that stature to be able to speak to them. And I think this is a, a heritage of where through our education system, through our colonial system, we gave black people the image that somebody in power or in status was dressed in a suit, was dressed, you know, in that way. And your worker, your not so well educated person was more humble person was not dressed like that. And you take your instructions from that person. And I think this has crept in and that heritage has just continued. So um, I think part of it is simply our background where we've come from as a nation. But I've got to say, I think part of it is um, a, 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 a measure of power by some of our people who are in positions of power. I've, I've got to say that. I think it's both. That yeah. I think some of them actually um, want that and agree with that and, and will facilitate that and will encourage that um, because it gives them that sense of status and power. I'm, please, again, I'm speaking from my white perspective, you see, and, and, I'm, yes. and I'm saying that again. But that's how I see it. And, and, and this is from journal articles, from um, Letters to Dimension, from my interviews. I, I interviewed 72 ministers for my master's and doctorate. You know, and this came through time and again um, in, in this issue of power, power, power. Uh, either for it or against it through, and even the liturgy was a way of saying power. God's got power in the liturgy, yeah. you see. So um, unfortunately, that's the unwanted message that comes through. Okay, mm -hmm. that's my thought. Thank you so much. Um, in <laughs> that, and I'm, and I'm hoping that I'm not throwing in, you into the, the minefield as you asked. Can, can, is it also safe to say that maybe um, our white ministers do not respect power um, in, in, in a sense, uh, whereas our black ministers are slaves of that power? And this is, this is where, where I'm coming from. When you now talk about the liturgy, um, so that is um, a, a, a structure that gives, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's structures that give us structure in terms of our Christian calendar, you know, where we are at as Christians no. and, on, and all of that. So if no. you're saying white people do not adhere to that, so does, can that maybe say that um, some of our, our white ministers do not respect power or order or protocol? Okay. Well, yeah. I think you've raised two very important issues there, is that where is... Um, that, that in terms of, for example, preaching, you will often find in our white context that they will do theme preaching as opposed to following the lectionary, except for holy days. So your Advent season, your Easter season, your Pentecost season, etc. you see. And again, I think that's more a cultural thing in the process. I think the, and I think we have lost something at times by doing that, because the, the lectionary provides a very good basis for reading through the scriptures. So where I think a black context is good, even in the dress thing of structure, you see, there's a structure, the lectionary, there's a structure, even in our laws and discipline, there's a structure. So 
Um, I'm now I'm okay. So I think that's helpful for people. I'm saying my experience is, and I'm talking about me. That's why I, I said I want to do what's going to get me closer to my people. Yes. So if it means that I'm not going to wear a suit in that situation, then I won't. But if it means that I will in that situation, then I do, you see. So when I, in this circuit, went to Kanyamazan or Kabakweni or, or all these, uh, Lakazi or these churches, I would always wear a jacket. And when they would see me perspiring like crazy, they would say, Maruti, take your jacket off. And I would normally say, I had a dream last night and I spoke to Mr. Wesley. And Mr. Wesley said, why do you people still all wear jackets? And of course they laugh, but I make the point and I then say to them, thank you for giving me the permission to do that. Yeah. So you see how I'm linking the issue of structure, which can be helpful, but it can be abused. And so we've got to be careful how we use that structure, whether it be the liturgy on a Sunday service. You see, although we might not use that full liturgy, I prepare my prayers very well, although they're extempore. That I make sure that my prayers, my reading, you know, everything, I bring in the creed, I bring in the Lord's Prayer, that that's all there. It's And um, extempore and, uh, can be very sloppy and slovenly. That's the problem. And this is where liturgy does provide structure. So, you know, I'm speaking for both sides here. And again, I'm saying what's helpful is what we've got to look at. What's the context saying? And for me, as, as but again, that's my gifts, has been what's going to get me close to people? And if I'm going to offend them, I'm not going to do it. It's not going to be useful, not going to be helpful. Sure. Okay. Yeah. yeah, no, thank you so much. Uh, um, let us now talk about, st still on the liturgy part. You know, there is part of, um, of our liturgy where um, whenever you, we recite the prayers and there is a line that says, God bless the queen. In Africa, we've never had the queen. <laughs> and we have to say it every single Sunday. What will it take in order for us to Africanize or to decolonize our liturgy? I, I, wish, I wish our church would take it. This is why I did my doctorate. This is the whole reason why I did it, to say we cannot keep our colonial liturgy. We're not being fair to Africa. Yeah. We're not being fair in our context. Um, and I put nothing else that I, our DUCOM, this is why I did my doctorate, to give it yeah. to DUCOM um, and to say, please, can we start a discussion around, uh, around these things um, to help our church change? Uh, I must say that as far as the covenant with my masters, the covenant relationship, the church interacted with me deeply and we looked at very significant areas of the covenant relationship um, and 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 that was good um, and I'm pleased you people are doing this because I think it needs to come from the groundswell it's not going to come from the top it's going to come from people like you uh, as I've explained you know our background our how where and 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 the strengths and the weaknesses i'm trying to be fair to both sides yeah um you know maybe i should also uh, make a disclaimer to you that i am a newly commissioned local preacher um, in the methodist church and um, one of the things we have been taught is that you follow the lectionary to the t to the to a point where when you're an on trial um preacher your services got, become longer because you do you jump hoops more than what other local preachers do because it's almost like you're it's a it's a training ground. Mm -hmm. um, so you if, even even um, the liturgy you have to follow it to the T. The prayers you have to read all of the prayers, even though the book says you, after this you only have to pray three yeah. prayers, but you are forced to pray all of the prayers. You know, um, mm -hmm. which is. Um, opposite of what, what the book says. 
And that's um, why the local preachers department needs to look at that. And on yeah. the local preachers department, one of the questions for the assessment of local preachers is their dress. And in my thesis, I said, what if I go with my open neck shirt and lead a service and I've got three black local preachers who expect me to be in a suit, you know, and tie, et cetera, are they going to mark me down? Um, you know, this is exactly the issues I've raised in my thesis. Yeah, sure. Now, um, let's, go to, let's go to best myth, dress, dress code, Reverend. Okay. And I think um, uh, with the dress code, uh, maybe uh, as a side note, um, I, one of my, my, my trial services was during COVID. So during COVID, we used to do um, virtual services yeah. um, the way you and I are doing. And literally, you would only see this part of myself, yeah. like the way, mm. the way you see it. On that day, I, I actually laughed at it. On that day, I was wearing a suit uh, covering all the way to my neck. And the person dressed up marked me down and I asked myself, what is it about what I was wearing that was so wrong or so offensive or inappropriate? But anyway, that's a story for another day. No, but can I say, here's my point. It's the issue of power. It's your old preachers trying to show we're the boss. You've got to do it like us, like we've done it. You know, yeah. uh, it happens with ministers as well. It's not only with local preachers, you know. Yeah. And I'm saying we need to adapt. Yeah. So so one, one of your submissions, you actually said that your concern is that the clerical dress code for female clergy is very masculine. And I absolutely oh. agree with you. Because even now, we uh, some people still... Um, wonder or question female ministers who wear uh, dresses uh, with a collar or who wear pants yeah. with a collar. And the same can be said about our local preachers association where yeah. women are expected to wear ties and a shirt. That's and right. you get to decide for women, um, yeah. you must wear this, that, and the other. But for That's men, it's crazy. almost simple. So how do we change this? Should we even change this? Uh, should we even allow women to for themselves, what they are comfortable with. Okay. The, the, the place to do this is through DUCOM. Because DUCOM deal with the doctrinal issues. They make the uh, presentations to the yeah. connectional executive. Um, and your organizations uh, need to send their proposals, make their proposals at your conferences, your, 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 um, your, your uh, annual conferences, um, to DUCOM to say, this is our proposals, this is what we're suggesting. And it needs to come from the organizations. Uh, and they need to present, this is what it is. Be uh, yeah, uh, that's the route within the Methodist Church Again, it's the old colonial system of the structures. Who's the boss? Who's in order for each kind of thing? It has its good points, but it can be a pain. And we need to be more flexible. So your organizations, like your local preachers department, your needs to make those proposals to DUCOM uh, and present their proposals to DUCOM. That's the way to go. Sure. Okay. Um, thank you. Now you spoke that everybody knows that we are a breakaway church from the Church of England, from the Anglican Church. And here we are now in Africa. Um, and I've seen that some of the African issues or issues that are pro-Africa, the church is not ready to deal with, uh, be it uh, vestment-wise or liturgy-wise. Um, so who in the church do you think is not ready? Because I do not think Africans would not, not be ready to talk about African issues. Um, so who or, or where are we receiving this bottleneck of, of um, lack of attending to African issues as the Methodist Church of Southern Africa? Okay, I, I want to make just a little comment and I promise you I'll come to your point. If you Google, for example, the Methodist Church in Nigeria, mm -hmm. their dress code is even more colonial 
than what we see with our South Africans. <laughs> yeah. So it's not only a South Southern African issue. It seems to be a general Africa issue. Yeah. If you look at the other Methodist connections, um, it's the same. Your um, your AME, your American, you know, your your the American Methodist system are far more strict than us in not having these. But some of the others, especially those linked with your British connections, your Nigerian uh, and other nations, uh, it's very much so part of this uh, uh, colonial dress, etc. you see. So, um, you know, I'm just trying to point that out, that it's not only our, um, you know, our, our okay. issues. I think there's a second facet to this is that with our younger people coming into the church, this is going to force the change. Because the old hands are going to be used to what they're used to. You see? Yeah. So, for example, we now have a black minister here at Millsprate, you know, and our people are having to learn to adapt to him having a, uh, a, a, a more of a liturgical service, you see. And I'm saying that is good, you know, we need to adapt. Um, but we also need, because of the needs of the people, I believe, in terms of more of the informal without etc etc to we need to find a way ahead of what's going to be helpful in the context more than you know more than anything and so come back to your point i believe that it's when only people like preachers when your guild people you're under 35s you are the ones who need to through your conferences and through your your district this is where you need to be bringing those things to your district and to your conference that, and make your voice heard there. That's the only way that it, is, that, that it is going to change. If you can find a bishop who is supportive of that, that's even better still. That you can then work through that bishop, um, you know, to help your cause in connectional executive and in, in, in other meetings. Um, and I'm not saying that they've got to do your hard work for you, but I'm saying simply that to make sure that the stuff is presented, you just want to be heard. That's the bottom line. To be heard and, yeah, okay, like I did my studies, that the church can hear it. Now, you people have responded. You need to do this. The church can respond to you. Yeah. There, there's <laughs> one point that you made, Reverend, about priesthood of all believers. Mm -hmm. um, and the, our previous lay president, Mr. Ngozi, mm -hmm. wrote about every member ministry, That's which right. marries to this priesthood of, of all believers. Yeah. It is also my understanding that I think it was last year or a year before last when the church was talking about sacraments. We were now in COVID times. Ministers cannot be everywhere. People are not receiving uh, our Holy mm -hmm. Communion. So mm -hmm. there was a conversation of whether the church should allow deacons Mm. Uh, to also officiate yeah. uh, Holy Communion. Mm. Uh, Professor, now Professor Dion Foster wrote a, a response to a paper in that regard, and he said, absolutely not. This is only specific to ordained I minister, know. but we also have deacons who are ordained. Mm. Uh, um, you know, so my question is, if we continue in this manner, how do we now exercise priesthood of all believers when yeah. we are continuing to set these things so differently and separate ourselves um, in this manner? And I'm not saying he was correct, and I'm not saying he was incorrect. I'm just throwing it to you. <laughs> yeah, you know, and I acknowledge that at the start where I said we've got our orders to word and sacraments. You see, deacons yes. are ordained to word and service. Service. Mm -hmm. and not to sacraments. So that's why, you know, deacons can't. Uh, so I'm acknowledging that, you know, the, the exact, you know, part of what you're saying within our church's structure. Um, but I'm also saying is that when I go into a black context, it's the ministers who will serve the communion elements to the people very, very seldom will they even use the stewards 
or a local preacher to help distribute the elements. Whereas in our white context, um, and I've been doing it for 30 years, if not more, at every communion service, I have a lay person helping with the distribution of the elements. But I don't see that happening in the black contexts, when, wherever I've been, you know, it's been, that's the minister's role. Now, I'm, again, I'm saying to you, I'm coming from a white perspective with me getting close to people. I want the steward who works with the people um, to be able to get close to the people and give them communion. Not only me as the minister, so I'll work with the steward, you know. So that's, so this is where I would differ with Dion. And Dion and I had great discussions around this as part of my studies, you see. And, um, I, and uh, yes, and Dion is being the purist, and I'm probably not the purist. Um, so, so, yes, you see what, so uh, I'm suggesting that part of it is that even the, 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 the half black, the hooking point is, is that some of our ministers don't even want, don't even allow lay people to assist them at communion. Now, how are they going to allow a lay person to take communion to somebody? And how is that person going to accept it from a lay person? So this is all part of our heritage, you see, which I was raising earlier on, that yeah. Um, in our white context, um, it's been done for years, so it's more acceptable. Um, so, but um, I have been with, um, with, with, with lay people, especially when there's been a death, uh, in a black, into a black situation where we have taken communion, you know, and, and where the lay person has done that with the family members who couldn't be there. Whether that was right or wrong, uh, I don't know. But I know for those family members, it meant a lot that here somebody who was with them in their grief could bring them the sacrament. So um, again, I think we need to look at it as this issue of, of silos. We need to look at the issue of silos. We need to look at the issue of structures. And unfortunately, it's power which comes into it again. Yeah. Sure. And don't shoot me for saying that. <laughs> I, I would never do that. I'm, I'm just happy having this conversation. You know, uh, on, on the contrary, we, with where, where some of our societies and circuits are, you do find that the minister has a responsibility to bless the sacrament, yes. but they would assist they would require either local preachers or stewards yeah. to assist in distributing um, yeah. the yeah. sacraments. Yeah. Sure. So that happens. So now, the, yeah. the, you know, I, I think the jury's still out in, in that particular sense mm. uh, of who touches that sacrament. Who but I've been, I've been to a church in a black situation where I asked the steward and I was stopped by the other stewards. You know, um, they said we don't do that. Yeah, <laughs> sure. I, th I think there's there's a lot of teaching that needs to to, to That's carry on. That's the point. It's to understand yeah. it. Yeah, and I, I think. Do, do you think, Rev, that maybe we should in our conventions, consultations, on and, and even right. CQMs and society lo lo um, leaders meetings, maybe we need to change the agenda. Um, yeah of those meetings, because some of those agendas, uh, as agenda points may be construed as being redundant. And there are these types of issues which are so important for the church to discuss, but there is no place for them no space. Uh, in the agenda points. No space, yeah, yeah, I agree with you. You see, and again, this is a colonial thing, which yes. Wesley introduced of the questions. You answer the questions in a meeting. Yeah. And that's what a meeting is for, to deal yeah. with the questions of the courtly meeting, of the synod, of the, you know, whatever it is, instead of yeah. what's going to help and facilitate ministry. Mm. Um, so, so <laughs> I am going... <laughs> So I am going to, to, to say one thing. You know, the, the, the manel that we wear as, as yes. local leaders, so be, before, yeah. or rather during during my, my, my time, 
I looked for the definition of the word Manel. And it shocked me, but it also didn't shock me. And one of the, the definitions in the Mac, uh, Macmillan Dictionary, it says, it is a panel of experts or participants that consists of men only. Mm -hmm. So over and above just- it's a it, male dress. It is a male dress. Yeah. And it yeah. is about um, yeah. a, an event that only consists of men. So. Yeah. As That's the church, we continue to perpetuate patriarchy mm -hmm. and we force women into a patriarchal system. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we see that now as a norm, as part of the church. Mm -hmm. And you said earlier on that none of these things are, are regulated in the Methodist Book of Order. Yes, in the constitutions of different organizations, but not in the Methodist Book of Order. Mm -hmm. How do we now fix this problem <laughs> it, it, it needs to go through the organizations you see it's got to go through the organizations um sure. and 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 dealing with ducom you see because it's yeah. uh, what i'm suggesting is we we need to get our theology right we we've allowed practice to determine our function we need to let yeah. theology determine our practices what are we saying in our theology of dress? Why are we saying that the minister who happens to be a guild member has got to wear, can wear a clerical, what, why is that necessary? What's more important? To me, what's more important is the link with the guild, with the YMG, to link as a YMG member. You know, what's going to, you see, it comes to that, what's helpful. Uh, so we need to work through the, the, what's our theology of dress? And when we've looked at our theology of dress, we can look at what's our purpose of our dress code. Who are we going to reach? What's going to be helpful? What's not going to be helpful? As opposed to letting just what is, um, what is nice, what looks nice determine the way the, the, the way that we function so we need to look at the, the the doctrine of the priesthood of all believers if this is what we're saying if we as the church are saying we believe in uh, the priesthood of all believers if we believe in women as being equal to men etc in ministry why have we got such a strong dress code for which is yeah. so male oriented uh, that would be the way to deal with it from a theological perspective, not yeah. from a functional perspective, because that's a colonial um, throwback. Yeah. So I think finally, the other concern that I just thought about is that our male clergy, uh, in any organizations that they're part of, there is provision for them to wear their collars. With, to wear differently, with, yeah. Yes, yeah. to wear their collars with the, that particular uniform. Yeah. However, when you come to our female clergy, there is no such a provision in the women's manyan or any other yeah. organization in order for them to wear their collar, you know, to yeah. separate them and, and, and show that they okay. uh, possibly are set apart. Um, or Except or, the manyana. It's only if the manyana, yeah. if, if she is married to a minister, she can wear the cape. The cape, yes. So that's where the distinction else. in the manana. But so the person who wears the cape, um, but remember, the person who wears the cape is the wife or the spouse to a male minister. minister. I'm talking about female clergy themselves. Yes. No, in order for them to I'm be saying. members, in order for them to be members of the women's manano, yeah. the women's manano uniform does not give the minister who is a woman allowance for them to wear their collar mm -hmm. with that particular uniform. Um, so I think uh, yes, that also yes, needs it's, to be looked at. It's usages again. It's not theology. Yeah. Um, you know, it's usages which is determined at our practices. We must allow our theology to determine our usages. Yeah. So a question <laughs> from, from a question from our viewer, uh, Noma Bell is saying, why do we have such a strong dress code which is male oriented? It's um, it's part of our colonial background, and it's part uh, part of the issue of of um, uh, when I say colonial background in terms of our dress, 
in part of the whole education system of the person dressed like that is the one who gives the orders, the one who is the knowledgeable one, who is the magistrate, the teacher, you know, the policeman and that sort of thing, was in a uniform. So it's a heritage thing of ours. And, um, we need to rethink, um, is that what we want to? Is that the message we want to give? It needs to be yeah. appropriate. I come to that word appropriate time and again. Um, yeah. yeah. Sure. Yeah, thank you so much, Reverend. And the one, uh, she's also saying we cannot keep this colonial liturgy uh, in, in the Methodist Church of, of, Afri of Southern Africa. But I also get, I think before we close, there are a few things and points that I take, and I'm going to give you some time to give your closing remarks to everyone. May I make one quick comment of what you've said there? Um, yes. And that this is where I commend our Minister Reverend Tiri Obani, who's here now at Nelspreit, where he hasn't used the full liturgy you know, when he's brought the liturgy into the service. Yeah. He has limited it to the basic ingredients, you see. So that's where your local preachers could start looking at what would be helpful. Again, what's helpful in including yeah. and not including um, yeah. is, is, is my point. And that's where what, uh, even although his, his form is liturgical, it's not the full liturgy as we would know it. So we don't have the creed every time, for example, but there are times that he will have the creed, you know? Yeah, um, uh, yeah. okay, I've said enough. <laughs> Thank you. I, I think this needs a, a whole conference, you know, to talk about liturgy um, investments in the church. Because another thing that we, you and I tonight have not even spoken about is um, are the colors um for uh, uh, our liturgical uh, uh. colors you know it's purple it's black it is white it is red um you know do and you the know meaning where, do you know where the red and black and white comes from please don't tell me it is uh, the the soldiers colonial. in england it's the <laughs> colonial colors when the british forces came and fought in south african soil that was the color of the military uniforms that's why they were called the red coats. That's why they wore the they were called the red coats. And here Those we are, are the, so many years yeah. later. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we have and but you see again, we need to see in our context in the Christian church, it makes good sense with the red of sin, the white of forgiveness, you know, you go, oh, the yes. red of the cross, the, the black of sin. So there's a good symbolism there, but it is still links back whether we like it or not that's yeah. where it came in <laughs> but but do you think I, i'm now throwing in something totally opposite we have the south Af the new south african flag and i know yeah. i've made this point to other people you know the white in the south african flag commemorates the influence of the, of british people of england in in getting south africa where it is so mm. is this you know is this bigger than just the, the, the methodist church of southern africa because i think even as south africans we now held on to to our colonizers to say you know for a lack yes. of a better word okay you see again this is the balance we need to take what is good and wholesome from our heritage yes and build on that with what is relevant in our African context. You, you see, if you even take our national anthem, it was produced to try and bring us together. Yeah. But the time's going to come when we've got to move on from it, you see. And, yes. and the same thing with, um, you know, with, with our liturgy, the same thing with um, uh, yeah, so I, I'm saying we need to learn from what we got from Britain, even with our flag, you see, we need to learn, it's, uh, it was, the flag was produced to as a, try and bring us together as a nation. If we see some of the proposals that there were for the flag, they were, I don't think they were so good. Um, and this at least had some form, and I'm proud of that flag. You know, yeah. and I was waving it on Saturday for the rugby, you know, yeah. um, 
because that's um, that's my team, that's my country, you know. And what a joy it was on Saturday to hear them singing the national anthem. The first part they sang as well as the second part of the national anthem. Yeah. And that to me was, I just said, lovely. This is what we need to do. You see, we need to take from the past what's good and helpful. And yeah. again, what's appropriate. That to me, time and again, I'm coming to that from my pastoral perspective. Yes, sure. Thank you so much, Reverend, for this conversation. Uh, thank you so much for your insight. It is so important for us to have these conversations, especially from our supernumeraries who have had the lens of watching the church as active ministers, and then later on, uh, after superannuating, you know, to say we want the best for this church of ours, and these are the issues that we think need to be discussed. But now you are passing the baton back to us to say to us, you as young people take mm -hmm. take up space. Uh, this mm -hmm. is your church now, mm -hmm. and this is how we can see yeah. you changing it for the better and mm -hmm. for our future. Now, one person is saying, uh, somebody, they don't listen to him. Uh, okay, I think when, when she, she translated to English, then I can, I can just send it to you. But I think they're just talking about uh, the vestments, you know, the Ray Baki and, and the Manel. So, Reverend, I'm going to give you some time to give us your closing remarks and maybe a few words of encouragement to some of us who still want uh, to belong to the church, but also would love to be part of the positive change that I believe this church really needs at a time such as this. Okay, super. Uh, first of all, just say thanks for the opportunity. I've tried to be real and honest. And I say again, I've come as a white as I retired, you know, from my own background and my passions, you know, and that's different to others, you know, yeah. and yeah. I, I accept that. I want what's going to work for us and, and, and to think around that. I'm just pleading for the theological basis for, you know, for, for, for what we do um, and to move away from legalism. We, we've got so much legalism in our church to move yeah. away from that legalism um, you know, which is there, um, and to take seriously our ecumenical relationships, you know, with, with, with the others. I'm also saying, from a liturgy perspective, let's be careful. Some people, some preachers become lazy who use the extempore form because they don't prepare properly. They don't yeah. prepare their prayers properly. They don't prepare the order of service properly. And, and, and uh, it comes through and it can lead, uh, it's inappropriate, uh, you know, in, in, in the process. So, um, and, and we must be careful that our liturgy, when we do use liturgy, that it doesn't become rote and it become dull. Uh, it's got to become alive. And um, yeah, you have a huge task. Bless you, enjoy it. The Lord be with you and go well. Thank you ever so much, Reverend. It gives me such great pleasure to have had this conversation with you. And thank you for being honest, you know, about the issues that we face, especially as a white man in South Africa, you know, given when we talk about colon colonialism, we look at you as being the face of colonialism. And here you are saying to us, we can and we have to be mm -hmm. as African as we can mm -hmm. as the church, you know, because I believe that the church needs to meet people from a place of their need or from their place of need and from where they are. So when we come to Africa, we need to meet Africans from an African perspective instead of us just always taking in from our colonizers. Um, and I think one of the changes and um, that I would love to see personally is our white ministers being treated the same as our black ministers. Um, it should not be a black thing that a minister is responsible for far more circuits and societies, while a white minister is only responsible for one or two, and they mm. never get to stretch themselves. Um, and that is why I think the the um, the lack of parity of stipend comes from because then our white ministers do not have to travel as far and as wide as what our black ministers have to travel mm -hmm. in, and yet the stipends and 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 income, if I would to call it, are still not equal because the other people are not using it as much as, as some. You know, these are some of the changes that I would personally love to see uh, in our church <laughs> going forward. 
obviously the dress code we i mean i you can see my nails i have red nails i love lipsticks and 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 i get on there and you know with my because this is what makes me feel more of a woman you know it doesn't make me a woman but it makes me feel that this is who i am you know beautiful hair and we have been forced to cover our hair um, and I said to you before we went online that I am a, a, a Mubedi, and in my culture we do not we do not cover our hair. You know, even when we do our cultural um, uh, uh, things and wish, uh, 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 work, we do not cover our hair. Now I come into a church that forces me to cover mm -hmm. my hair, and mm -hmm. they force me to cover it with a black something black. Uh, black is also a sign of mourning uh, to some of us. So that it, it is where you know where you feel like. Okay, where is it? And then sometimes when you follow these things, you list, you, you find that it is actually people who bring their own culture and they enforce it into my culture. And Religion. they also enforce it into the religion. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, so so there, there isn't that diversity. I, it is my prayer that we find diversity, you know, as... Bless as, you, bless you, God. bless you. <laughs> well. And if they... Reverend, if they chase me away from church, I'm coming to find you in nail spray. <laughs> <laughs> um, Go and, well, and to all of your listeners, the Lord be with you all. Thank you so much. And before we close uh, with a prayer, I am. I, I need to also let you know that Reverend Tao's signature is on my um, marriage certificate. He is the one who blessed my husband and I over 14 years ago when we were getting married and his signature is there. And I'm very proud to have his signature uh, being on my marriage certificate. He is a wonderful love man you. and I love him. <laughs> um, thank you so much, friends, for joining us today. It is my prayer that this conversation must go down to our societies where we add to our uh, uh, annual society meetings, where we add to our society leaders meetings, when we add these conversations to our CQMs in order for us to affect the church and influence the church positively as South Africans, as Southern Africans, but most importantly, as Africans. Um, Reverend Williams, would you please do us the honor of closing for us in prayer? Mm. With pleasure. With pleasure. Thank you. Let's pray together. Uh, we celebrate, Lord, that you make each one of us so different and yet so unique and real. You know us by name. You know our natures. You've gifted us. Thank you, Lord, for that. May we hear your call on our lives. May we use who we are and the gifts we have to help establish your kingdom. May it be done in a way that is graceful in a way that brings people peace and love and power. So come, Holy Spirit, fill us, empower us, give us your joy and your gifts. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Amen and amen. And once again, to all the women out there, Happy Women's Month. And to all women, uh, women clergy, women preachers, take up space. Uh, be the woman in that particular calling because God called you not to be a man in that particular calling, but to be the woman who shares the good news of God. God bless you and good night. Good night.